Thank you very much, Sandra. So, hello everyone. Um, I'm Walter Fernand. I've been working with Scala for the past five years and a little bit more. And it is actually my first uh, opportunity to present at Scala Portugal. So I'm super excited for that. And I'm very, very thankful for the invite, Sandra. Once again, thank you very much for that. And just to give a bit of context. So uh, I work for Carpe Data, which is a, a big data company, which leverages data to produce some kind of business value for insurance companies. So we're part of the insure tech market. Um, we're headquartered in Santa Barbara, California, USA, and we have an office here in Lisbon since 2019. Uh, we're close to 150 employees with 50 of those being here in Lisbon. So we're a third already here in, in Lisbon. And that's very cool. So as to what we do, if this was a pharmaceutical ad, I'm going to try to do it in 30 seconds. So essentially what we do is we'll leverage web and open availability data online. So think of social networks and reviews, websites, and alternative data. So stuff like uh, cell phone usage or email usage or certain types of availably open data from government and stuff like that. And then we just produce products which allow the insurance carriers to uh, identify or predict certain behaviors or just integrate in their processes, automating stuff and becoming more efficient and more um, performant. So that's it, that's all we do. Uh, but right now you're probably thinking, okay, cool stuff, but what is this talk really about? So um, the title that I gave to this call is actually a new kind of magic or a different kind of magic. And I'm gonna go into the topic of changes right now. So let's first talk about changes in our careers. So this is a very open topic and I probably, if we were all inside, I would ask you, please give me some words that I can put in, uh, in a board and we'll talk about them but I had to just come up with mine. And essentially you'll fall into this pretty much as you're going through your career. So you change your employers probably, the core business changes dramatically, your team, your role, your project will change a million times probably. The technology is always evolving. So you always have something new coming up next uh, month, next year, something like that. But technically we tend to stick around the same programming languages for quite a while. And a good example is, we have a lot of folks here which just done Scala in their lives and I'm super jealous of them because I had to deal with stuff that wasn't that pretty, believe me. So um, in terms of those changes, even Scala, so such a pretty language, did change along its way. So it not only evolved from its first version, now we're not up to version three, right? But it also changed in the stuff that it was used for. And that's actually that big change that we're going to talk about today, man. So, but before we talk about Scala, we probably cannot ignore the rest, which is what happened before it. And Scala did not appear for just for the sake of fun. And uh, the dot-com boom was where it all started, I would say. So we started having websites um, now three and four decades ago. And uh, in the beginning, there were PHP, HTML, very ugly. Pardon if I offend any old folk. Uh, but yeah, they were just not that great. And when the web started moving forward, we started having those smart websites. So the ones that have a clear division between the front end and the back end. And that's when a certain language that uh, the folks around this community tend to hate quite a lot showed up. So Java. And Java showed up and it was very, very used to do web applications. Web applications were the big thing of the software engineering market for quite a while. And Java came with a lot of stuff that was very cool. So the JVM where we could execute it everywhere, all the server tools, so Tomcat and stuff like that, which became deprecated nowadays, was very useful back then because we could run the applications inside of it and put our website somewhere running. And all the frameworks that came after that, so think of Spring and other more recent like Play or even the ones that Scala created like Legom and stuff like that, they, they do originate from this uh, progression, if you want to say it. So when Scala showed up, if we think about the production usage of the language, it was inside this box. So although we might say, oh, it's functional, it does a lot of stuff that uh, Scala, uh, the Java did not do well, uh, it still was here. So it was still used being inside the uh, web applications quite heavily, and that was the market for the language. But 
in the last um, decade, pretty much. So something showed up, which was called Spark, and the big data boom happened around the Spark stuff, pretty much. And all of a sudden, Scala, which was a language that was being used on this um, scope, did flee away from it a little. And uh, that's where it goes into a completely different kind of magic, because Spark and all the big data processing has so little in common with the web applications that it's even shocking. And I'm saying this out of experience. And if you asked me three years ago, I would say, no, that's the same stuff. Uh, but it isn't. It's completely different, believe me. So yeah, that's the progression for Scala and where the actual name of this uh, talk comes from. So what next? Um, I'll go and talk about the, the uh, differences of these worlds pretty much. So if you think of the web application again, you, you might be using Scala and it might be mainly functional, but you have to know a lot of other stuff like complex ar architecture, microservices, all of the deploy related stuff. Like if you're using uh, Kubernetes and all of that, you have to learn it. It's very specific to that use case. And uh, if you're in something a little bit older, you probably still are dealing with self-hosted uh, uh, services or you have them hosted on virtual machines. And that was pretty much it in terms of cloud usage up until recently. While if you jump into the data engineer thing, which is what happened with me and a lot of my folks in the team, we jumped from a completely into a completely different thing. So although it's still the same language, we're still using it mainly functionally. Um, the, the Spark based architecture, if you want to call it, is so different. And all of those frameworks that you got used to use weren't there anymore. So you know the language, but you don't know anything else. So that's quite complicated. And um, also, Spark showed up because we couldn't run things locally. So essentially, instead of running stuff in one machine, which is what is more common for services, things will run in clusters of machines, which is where the leverage of big data comes from. Um, and the services that tend to provide this and that are the most common in the market are AWS through their EMR cluster or the Databricks. And um, yeah, that's where the biggest differences are in between those two worlds. So, okay, but what are really the challenges in this change? And uh, there are some which are obvious and there are some which aren't, and we're gonna go into them. So the first one, and this is actually a challenge of, of anything. So when you jump from one thing to another thing, there will be probably words that change and you have to adapt to those. So, so for these two worlds, it's kind of funny that there isn't a single word that, that carries over. So you were used to call something an application, you're gonna call it a pipeline if you were to create a parallel with something else. A service on the, on the world of web applications is a job for a pipeline. And a server, forget about it, it's a cluster. So it's EMR uh, or whatever the service you're running. And then uh, even like when you think of an endpoint on the web applications world, they tend to have a request and a response you move over to um, pure data engineering and you don't hear those words. You hear input and output, and that's what they mean. They're what goes into the job pretty much. And that's it for vocabulary. There are more examples, but these kind of show you like, so those words are completely different, right? Uh, as for new technologies, it, it was pretty much everything, like I said. So the, the fact that we lost all the knowledge that we had on those frameworks for APIs and they do not apply in here is quite shocking because you're just going to have to rely on the language and whatever frameworks exist for, for this world, right? But let's first talk with Spark. So Spark, um, it's uh, very heavy on configurations that you can do. And if you check the documentation, you'll be shocked at uh, how many there are and just all these configs and cluster management for, for whatever hosting uh, service you're using is a job for one person to be expert on in years of experience. So it takes a lot of time to learn all of those nuances and to be able to fine tune jobs and all of that. It's a very, very complicated thing. And that was certainly a problem for a team coming from some other area of knowledge. 
Fortunately, we did have folks joining in with, with that experience, so we kind of le leveraged that, but that was still tough. So another thing that happens is when you're doing web applications, you're you usually um, used to have your local storage or an FTP to store any kind of files. Well, for the Spark stuff, you're pro it, not probably, you're certainly stored somewhere else on a cloud. So for our, for our use case, we were storing everything on S3, which by the way, it's not even a file system. So it has a lot of nuances and we had to learn those too and how to use it without running into small issues. Then even the simple fact that you want to check something on your data to find a bug, uh, it's so easy when in a web application to just open your SQL server or whatever is the provider of data that you have, run the query, know the answer, and then do the rest of the work. As in here, if you have your files sitting on S3, you're going to have to crawl them, make them into a tabular version of the file. And then with Athena, which is a version of Presto that AWS coined with their name, um, allows you to run SQL queries, which is cool because at least all that knowledge that you had of SQL, you can still apply it. Some differences, of course, but you can still do stuff with it, which is nice. It allows you to explore the data. It's slower though. The volume is higher, it's expected. Uh, and it's expensive, by the way. Uh, on the um, other part, so I, I have an outlier point in there. So I, I'm talking about Spark and all of a sudden there's a point there mentioning other stuff which is related to APIs. So of course we don't produce data for the fun of it. We also have to sell it. So one of the ways that we sell our data is through APIs which are essentially search engines. And since we were on this uh, path of going completely serverless with everything, we decided to also do our APIs with um, serverless approaches. So we went with a combination of API gateway and AWS lambdas, and we did our own. I'm going to talk just slightly of the challenges that we had there and uh, some of the solutions that we came up with as well. Okay, so isn't new stuff the typical challenge from any job change? Uh, well, yeah, uh, until the no one has done before shows up. So as you saw from the previous presentation, fortunately for some areas of knowledge, someone has already done it. So you go look online, find the solution, import it into your project, you use it, great. Everyone is happy in the end. Uh, we did run into this unhappiness of finding out that no one had done it quite often, unfortunately. And we had to pretty much just do it ourselves. And I'm gonna talk about that. Those, these, those stories there. So examples, of course, that's, that's what we're here for. So there is one big problem with Spark. So Spark is a framework, but it happens to be a framework on a very bare level. So there's still a lot of extra framework layer or abstraction, if you want to call it, that is completely missing from the environment of the Spark libs, if you want to say. So just topics there that motivate this necessity is the fact that you, if you're doing a, something that is going to be run on Spark, you're going to have to deal with creating Spark sessions, dealing with the configs, and going through the whole document to find which ones you want to run depending on the environments you're going to use and all of that. It's, it's, it's a lot of work just in there. So there isn't any like pre-templated thing that you can use. And that's sad, in my opinion, because it does make a lot of people do the exact same work. And then on, on that note, repetitive things. So there's a lot of parts of the code, and I'll show some examples right straight away, that you have to repeat if you do a Spark application or a job for Spark multiple times. Them being the reads and the writes, so you have to kind of hard code them. And you have a lot of common operations that you end up doing multiple times and you soon figure out that the Spark dictionary of operations is kind of bare and it needed a bit more. So we kind of abstracted those and made them available inside the company so that we could at least do it just once and use it everywhere. One last part where Spark, and this is not really a Spark fault to be honest, but it, we still put it on the same uh, bulk, is the fact that then you have to put these applications running somewhere. So these 
artifacts that you produce, they have to run on that cluster that I mentioned. And you have two approaches that can do that if you're using AWS like we are. So either you use the AWS SDK and you create the code very pretty on a main, you click the run button and it's gonna run for you, or you go through the CLI approach, which is you're gonna have command line interface. So it's very big bash script with everything that needs to go into the call of that job. And you push them through a, through a console, it reaches the uh, cluster that you add up and it starts running on that cluster. So for that, uh, I'm also gonna show a few examples of where we were when we were in a prototype phase and how fast we run into the fact that there was no abstraction when we had to create it there. Okay, so as to Spark. So this is actually an example of 2019 code that was in, um, in Carpe. And uh, this was on a POC project that we were doing with, with Spark. And uh, of course I anonymize everything. So don't look at the weird names, they're intentional. Um, and uh, yeah, it already adds some abstraction, to be honest. If you look at the header of this map, you'll clearly see that it followed some kind of trait or pattern where you have this run method, which makes sense in name, that it's gonna get an in, which happens to be the input path to the file, and the out, which is the output folder where you expect to drop the result. And that Spark session is at least in there as an implicit. So it means that we were already sharing that Spark session through all our jobs, even though we we're calling multiple jobs. So that was already one abstraction we had done by then. But very far, you don't need to go very far to notice that there are things here which wasn't if, were inefficient. So you notice those logger message, that's the first thing. Although they are generic to actually check the class name, they were pasted there. So if you were to repeat and do another job, you would have to grab that logging and put it again there on the other job, which is probably gonna do the same plus something else. So not efficient there, right? Second thing is if you look at those um, encoders and those case class names, it's hard coded because it was necessary. If you were to do code like this, you would be forced to put those tight coupled on the job, which means that if the job needs to change to using something else, you would have to go and change in, a, in the hard coded parts. But it's even worse if you look at these JSON in, JSON out on the left side, most left side of the, the red boxes. They're hard coded to read JSON and write JSON. And if you need to switch, for example, to Parquet or something else, you have to come here, change the code, redeploy, and run again. So that's not flexible enough for something that goes into production and where you just need to deploy it once, use it forever, or until the new version comes out, right? So that was clearly a problem we were missing um, in terms of the Spark framework. And uh, we couldn't find it online back then. There wasn't anything that was doing all this layer of abstraction and we could just import and use. So long story short, we had to build it, right? And um, we came up with this funny name, which is Spark Core, which is Spark-Core was already used by the Apache Spark so a funny guy in our company said, hey, why not Sparkour is the version of parkour on Spark. So it's the Ninja version of Spark and everyone laughed and we just adopted the name. And that's the name of our framework for, for Spark. So this snippet of code is the um, refactored version of that previous job. So as you can see right there, everything was abstracted to the point of usability and composability. So you see the data set reader and the data set writer, there's something that you pass into this job when you call it, when you create it as, a, as an instance. The same goes for the read type tags and the write type tags, which are motivated by the fact that Spark uses reflection. Ugh, I know, uh, I don't like reflection either, but it's necessary for this case. But anyway, they're, they're there. And, you just write them once and they're there forever, pretty much. And then they're following a behavior pattern. So you see on that extends that it's following this pattern of one in, one out job data set uh, with two things inside of it. One being the input 
type and the other one being the output type or case classes if you want to call them and if you look right up below them you have this execute method which is the only thing you need to code if you use this framework so you only need to do your job which is to code the business logic inside that method the rest is already done by the rest of the framework so you don't have to be a pro in spark to come create a job and put it ready to run uh, but yeah that was spark but we didn't want to stop here and the reason we didn't stop was because our cli uh, which if you recognize the top um, lines of this snippet was using scopt and we have this main arc parser which Unfortunately, if you have very complex submit scripts, that means you have to create all of the combinations of the possible inputs and then react to the right combination and call the right job. And at the point that we decided to refactor, I would even say that it was slightly too late. Why? Because we had more than 3000 lines of this uh, thing. So we did decide, okay, since we already did a bunch for the Spark side, why won't, don't we do a pretty version of the CLI using the same approach? And that's exactly what we did. So if you look at this case, this is an abstract version of the arguments for a job of the previous type that I showed you. So one in, one out data set job. And this is the command arcs. So again, they follow a certain type of pattern and you're starting to see the stuff that you had to code a bunch of times it's around here. And if you look at these inputs on the getshop method, you will see that they resemble what we would expect for being able to inject the stuff that we wanna do with this job. And again, look down here, the line from the bottom, and you see that for the file reader that we're calling, so specific to reading a file on this one, um, we do pass the, the input that came from the commands, it's right up there. The file format, so we can play around with it, which is what we wanted. And we have a lot of other stuff that we can do, like inject other read options and more stuff like that. So all that flexibility we wanted from deploy once, use multiple times, or even try different stuff, we can do it because of this uh, CLI framework, if you want to call it. So this is the abstract version. This is the implemented version. So for the this job that I showed you, this is what the commands would look like. So implementation of the abstract class from the previous um, slide, you have to say what's the input, what's the output, and what's the actual job that is supposed to run these two. And uh, you'll see it again in here as the bottom line. So this override def method the def job method is the method that gets called to relay back the job in the main command args implementation that you're going to see in a while so i did show the main and it was ugly right uh this is a new version it fits on this small window so essentially you just say the pipeline name and that's not even necessary you can leave it empty string same for the header, which is going to be used on a lot of um, logging. And uh, what really matters is just the sequence. So you just declare which arguments you want to make available for this main class to be called through EMR. And now EMR has available these two jobs and you're done. You go grab a coffee and uh, that's pretty much it. You, you put your jobs to run, which is super cool. It's very fast development when you get used to it. But what exactly is the implementation of this main command args extension? So this would be the version of the old stuff, but now completely generic. So you see from the bottom up, the main method. So the very common main method, it has the arguments. And the main just called job, args, get job and apply. What are those? So the job is the method right above it, which is just going to figure out through parsing the arguments, which is the method above it. So the parse just parses it and figure out if that's a job that it should do something with. And if it is, it's going to fall on the right. And if it isn't, it's going to fall on the left, of course, and then returns that job on this method. So we go back to the main, then the get job is the method that I showed you. So it's going to return me the job. So I have an instance ready to run. And then when I call apply, I run that execute method that I showed you. So again, we didn't have to code this anymore. 
So we just build jobs, we put them on the command args, deploy. That's it. That was what we did. And uh, unfortunately, this is still not open source, but we might have to, to do that. Um, and uh, another thing that I wanted to share with you guys about the CLI is that we didn't even code it for that. But after a while, we figured out that it was very good to do in memory apps. And uh, you can see from the bottom here, this arg.getjob. You see in here that we're just passing the actual arguments in this in memory application. And then we call the same thing that was on the main and we were able to run this job in memory and we didn't code anything for it. It was already coded when the developer did the work for actual production job. So it becomes available to be used elsewhere, which is super fun. And we're gonna extend this usage and probably make it part of the, um, of the library as well. So yeah, you're probably thinking, do just read and I'll probably do that just two seconds, and then I'll move to a new topic. So now what other thing is really tough about big data? Uh, it's testing, um, it's, it's quite hard. So not only because the production volumes are stupidly high, we go a lot of times above the thousands of millions in order, um, where if you try to just create a sample to do your test, probably your sample is so small that isn't even representative of the actual data because there might be so many combinations that you don't get those in that sample. And even when you do, uh, even if you did half of the data, that doesn't guarantee that there isn't a very weird wet edge case on the last or second half of the data. So catching edge cases doing tests for Spark applications, which have so many fields and so many combinations of fields is hard, really tough. Then another thing that happens is like you come in and you're like, yeah, I was using TDD and that was awesome. And then all of a sudden people are like, but yeah, what are you gonna write manually the output that you expect out of this? Of course you don't because your output is gonna have 100 fields and no one in their perfect own mind is going to code 100 fields to then test if it got the 100 fields because it's more likely to get it wrong um, when it's creating to test than actually when coding the thing. So yeah, it doesn't work, unfortunately. So we had to do um, behavior driven design and even there, so it, by behavior, I mean, if a job is supposed to transform a certain field into something else, we can test that to reusable behavior driven uh, design tests, but we we still cannot do that for a lot of fields. Why? Because each uh, input type has different fields than the next, and those behaviors are also different. So it forces us to recode those tests again. And that's where we lose a bit of time, necessary, sure, but we wish we could be faster, and that's something we still have to improve a lot on. So again, I was talking about that example of like creating the output manually. Since we didn't want to do that, uh, we created a, a small app, which just gets a JSON line and converts that into a case class that we can then just copy paste and run the test. Um, it, it made things faster, sure, quite a lot, but it's still painful to do. Um, other thing that is quite shocking is that you're so used in web applications to think of unit tests where you just test one small portion of the code, but now think you're trying to test one portion of a job that doesn't work because you need to like create the Spark session, create the, the um, Spark collection, put the input case class in it, call everything else, get the output, take it out of the um, Spark collection, and then compare the two outputs. This is an integration test mask just because the fact that it's just one single input. So it's not really unit. And that's what I mean, that it means something else. And then uh, another thing that is quite troublesome is that when you have case classes, which have millions of, of fields, reading the test error is a good luck uh, case of things. So I'm going to give you an example. Look at this example, which I just cut a snippet out of this color test output. So on the top is the actual, no, yeah, on the top is the actual, on the bottom is the expected. And uh, 
you instantly see where the difference is because lucky you these were aligned but not off more often than not they don't even align so you cannot see them like on a straight line for this this case in example but can any of you tell me which field that is no one can and neither can we so we were losing a lot of time trying to find them and we prefer to lose time creating something that finds them for us so we created prettyfy which is um a pretty printing test uh, plugin, if you want to call it, uh, which we haven't open sourced yet, but we will, I promise. Um, and uh, this is going to literally tell us like address.city was expected to be some Lisbon, and we actually got some power. So instantly it gives you that clean message, which you can just go address either on your code or your, on your test input and output to make the test pass. So a lot of time is gained just by this one small live quality improvement. And we are very glad we did it and we wanna share it with everybody. So you're now thinking, so you mentioned two very nice things, but none of it is open source. Do you have anything that is open sourced yet? Yes, uh, I did mention those serverless APIs and uh, when we run into them, we were like, yeah, let's let's do this. And uh, we went online and we found that there were some possible solutions, one of them being called very confusedly serverless as well. Uh, it allows you to deploy to multiple actually cloud providers, but it wasn't still that good in terms of deploy. It wasn't that flexible, so we weren't that happy with it. And we had a crazy folk in the company, which was like, I'm going to do this. And he did it um, on his own. Oh, that's amazing. His name is Taylor, by the way. Um, you can look uh, online for this library, Scalamda, and you can use it as much as you want. But essentially, the reason we created it is because we wanted a toolkit for building and deploying Lambdas simply because Lambdas are very, very hard for newbies. So if you don't know much about Lambdas, if you don't know much about AWS, you're going to have a lot of trouble figuring out on your own then we wanted something that would be just plug and play. So we did a plugin for SPT and that's what, how you get Scalamda. So you just put it on, on your build SPT and it's there straight away. And it just allows us to deploy easily. And uh, I actually have a few, a few figures. So on the deploy side right now, uh, it uses Terraform. So it's leveraging business, this, or, um, market standard tool for, for deploying, but instead of you having to learn it, it already comes pre-configured. So if you don't know, you don't need to know. It already does something. Then if you need to tweak it, you'll have to learn. But at least you could start with something. That was our point. And uh, if from you guys coming from web application development, Scalamda is play, but for the Lambda development. So it's pretty much a blueprint framework where you just have to hardwire a few things and code your actual business logic. And uh, it does so much for you and it takes away some so much specific learning away from you that if you were to just jump into Scalamda today, you had no, never done anything with AWS Lambdas, instead of taking like two hours reading documentation and coding an empty Lambda to just deploy it, you'll probably do it in five minutes. And you can even code something in it on those five minutes. Uh, then the same goes for updating an existing Lambda. Even though you already know all the stuff, deploying a Lambda does take a few steps and it's uh, quite slow, I would say. So it would take like close to 10 minutes, even though you might have some experience already. But if you're using Scalamda and you've deployed it once, well, you click again, you go again on the command line, you run the same command and it smashes the previous instance. So there you go. You already have it there. Uh, yeah, so that's Scalamda. Look it out, uh, like it, subscribe to it and contribute to it if you want. We would be very glad if you did. And now before I finish, uh, the most obvious thing, of course, we're hiring. So. Um, not only we have a lot happening on the data side, which is my, which was my focus on today's um, presentation, but we also have a lot of stuff going on on the app side. So it doesn't matter where you come from or where you want to go, just reach out to us. Uh, we're having a lot of open and new projects. So we have even positions for possible devs or tech leads. So reach out and we'll see what we can do. 
And um, for, the, for the fact that we're a data company, of course, we have a lot of focus on the data and we have a lot of data analysts already in-house. And when I mean a lot, it's past the 20, I think, last time I checked. And we're still looking for a few more. So reach out if you're a senior on this area or related areas like BI. And then again, I did mention how hard the tests are for us. And we barely have any time to look at that in depth. So if we were to get very good software engineers that wanted to just focus on creating test framework for a thing and making everything very, very reusable, they are more than welcome. So test engineers is something that we've been looking for quite a, a while. And please reach out if you want to join for that. But in parentheses over there, there's more. So um, if you see that uh, website there on the right, do go and see if there's something that could interest you to join uh, this amazing team that we have. And also, last but not least, our HR manager in Lisbon is Liz of Freide. So if you look for her on LinkedIn, you can also go through that path to uh, try and be hired at Carpe. And that's it. Questions.